Society in the 21st century. I have with me Dr. Kartike Steiny, Michelle Talwar, Mark Buckley, and Tanuj Nandan. They are going to introduce themselves at, at, at the beginning of when they speak. I want to thank the Open Business Council for putting on such a fantastic event and Dennis Guarda for organizing everything. It's been really exciting. Last couple, last yesterday was fantastic. And uh, I have some really great experts here. And today the idea is to think different and go big and talk about what big changes we need. And I want to start with a bit of a premise that education is completely broken. And that's put together in this book by Brian Kaplan, why the education system is a complete waste of time and money. So this, this is my thesis, this is my assumption that education is not working and that we can't fix it and we shouldn't fix it. We should do something else. And that's what I'm interested in talking about. Of course, we have experts here who will give their views, but I just wanna show, I just wanna start with one quick quote from the book. All common, uh, more, more college grads and in the United States college means University, same thing, four years from age 18 to 22. All more college grads work as cashiers or waiters than mechanical engineers. More college graduates work as security guards or janitors than network and computer system administrators. More work as cooks and bartenders than librarians. And and college prepares the next generation of cashiers and janitors for their careers. Uh, in most cases, you, you will get preferential hiring as a janitor if you have a college degree. Um, so most of this, Brian Kaplan claims that most of this is signaling and we have to readjust to, uh, to address the serious problems in the world. Now, I have, a, I have a proposal I'm going to give at the end, but I want to hear from our panelists. And uh, and just I'll just go from top to bottom because it's just randomly that way. So let's hear from Cartike. And the goal, the goal here is to is to build a, a platform for innovation and human thriving in the 21st century and no rigorous nonsense. Right. So. Right. So. So let's destroy the myths and whether it's education or training or, you know, we've got 50% of all jobs today are not going to exist in 30 years. And that's always true. So we've got a large scale problem on our hands. Carter K, tell us about what you're, what you're thinking. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, let me tell you briefly something about myself to introduce myself. I, I have uh, spent 15 years of my life in the Defense Forces, in the Indian Navy, as an engineer. I, I served in the first aircraft carrier of the Navy in frigates, in uh, training units, was a member of the first uh, Navy-wide uh, IT project by the name of uh, Integrated Logistics Management System. Those days, it was X.25 switches and, you know, lease lines and no, no sat links and no VSATs and no Wi-Fi's. Uh, I retired pre prematurely as a commander and then uh, joined my family business of manufacturing. But one thing which is which was very close to my heart and I founded uh, was a school 15 years back by the name of Scottish High International School. It's one of the largest uh, international baccalaureate schools of the world oh, wow. with, with 2,400 IB students under one roof. It's a ESPN unified school for inclusiveness and uh, rated as top 10 in this country. Uh, I also have a background of uh, working 12 long years in the field of disability. I was the chair of uh, Special Olympics of India uh, for four years. Right. 1.2 million athletes with disability and a board member of Special Olympics International Washington under Timothy Shriver, the nephew of uh, President John F. Kennedy. Uh, SOI handles 177 countries and five and a half million athletes with disabilities. So that, that's what I am. The topic of today, uh, David, is has a very, very large expanse. 
governments, businesses, universities? What do you do? What policies do you develop to support business and society? So I'm going to just narrow down uh, as one of the panelists to a couple of things which, which I'm very, very uh, passionate about. Because as such, uh, I'm going to be talking of uh, education and an education about uh, K-12 education because my fellow panelists are from universities and national institutes of higher education. Uh, so they'll be covering that. Sure. And within education, uh, I want to touch upon two things, and that is leadership and inclusiveness. David uh, said, you said, you know, we got to bring out radical ideas, transformatory ideas. There are no in incremental solutions we need to talk about. Uh, not what you get, what you pay. We don't have to give answers like that. And a quick review of your book, The Pull, and <laughs> your essay on the book, which doesn't exist, The uh, Machine Economy, really set the, the pace in thinking that if after 10, yeah, that's that's the book. Yeah. So if after 10 years, we're going to land up in a situations where human beings are going to be sitting as drivers, but not really driving the car, but a software would or drones would be controlling an accident free environment. The world of 2030 is going to be totally different. Imagine what it was 10 years back. I mean, without the web revolution and without the communication revolution. So if somebody would have slept back and woken up today, he couldn't have survived a day. Right. You know what? We are living that sleep with millions of children in this world in schools now. Yeah. They are sleeping. Yeah. They are sleeping. Right. The pedagogy, the curriculum, the syllabi. Whatever is happening, I'm an educationist, 15 years, one of the premier institutions, and I speak like that. They are sleeping. They will wake up after 10 years when they pass out of school or university, and they're going to find themselves in a different world. They'll wake up from that sleep. Can we wake them up now? That's right. what I'm going to be talking about. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of curricula. UUS has its own curricula. There's Cambridge. IGCAC, there's international baccalaureate, national curricula, provincial curricula in the states of India and China. We talk of academics, we talk of technology, you teach the latest technology, latest software languages, latest, latest front ends and back ends. But I don't see a subject which says how to handle change in technology. We talk of, in one of your own uh, uh, essays, uh, David, you have said, you have derived that another 10 years, we will have a situation where the top management, the higher wages earners and the lower wage earners may remain, but the middle age earners will vanish. They will be replaced by machines. We are just producing middle age earners today. Exactly. So what happens to all of them? Am I supposed to believe that all the students who pass out after 10 years from a college or from a school would be jobless? Yes, that's what it seems. Sure. So so, so what do we do? So I, I hear of schools like Eton in, in the UK who produce leaders. I have been, I'm an alumni of a, of a National Defense Academy, which, which kind of teaches a lot of leadership. But what about millions of schools, government and private schools in India and abroad? Yeah. Where you're just teaching the subjects in a, in, a, in, a, in a way which we really are not going to discuss today, not the teaching learning process. I, what I would like to say is that today the education system, the curricula, the syllabi, the pedagogies are not supposed to be upgraded not supposed to be revised, not supposed to be chiseled. They are supposed to be trashed. Yes. Now, we're, now what should we they, do? They should be chucked. So, so what do we do? Yeah. So, so you've got to begin 
one of my fellow pan panelists is going to talk a lot about that. Okay. Why you would want to begin at home, etc. I I think it it just cannot happen overnight. It has to happen like a revolution. It has to be happening like a disaster management, like a COVID management. There has to be a vaccine produced in the next 45 days. That is the urgency with which it has to be attempted by governments, government bodies, by educational institutes, by educationists, by researchers. I mean, where do we have? We don't have a single subject called leadership. Right. You may talk about a leader in a history class. That doesn't change. Anything. What about teaching, learning, assessment? I mean, it has to come come together. There are sent policies by the International Baccalaureate, by the IGCSE, how a blind student takes a test, for example, or or how uh, an autistic child can have a writer to in an examination. More time, extra time. No, <laughs> where is the teaching learning in India? You would be having, uh, let's say. How many? Let me. I have some statistics here. 1.5 million government schools, catering to 260 million students, uh, 40,000 private schools, 79 million students. There is not even one special educator for each school. Uh -huh. Not even one for one school. Not even one for 149 schools. When you're talking of an aut autism. Ratio today that one in every 35 children born is autistic at some spectrum. Yeah. And this is autism. You're talking of dyslexia, of yeah. epilepsy, right. difficulty learning. Right. So what do you do? It has to be taken at an international level, in a country at a national level. You just can't make a national education policy and say that we have not addressed leadership, we have not addressed inclusion, or if we have, it is somewhere in the afterword. No. So, so, can I, so can I say, I, can I say sure. the rest of it for the conversation and we can move through everybody? Is that okay? Kartike has really put the nail on the problem. The, the, the way I sum it up is that 500 years ago, you could have gone to any classroom and you would have seen more or less what we have today teachers talking to students and students writing things down, okay? No other profession is the same as 500 years ago, okay? Just one, okay? Not even porn is the same as 500 years ago. So so let me hear from, uh, I'd like to get five minutes from the other uh, panelists and let's go to Vishal. <clears throat> uh, good morning, David and uh, uh, Thanks very much for having me here today. Uh, just a brief on myself. Um, as uh, Dr. Saini mentioned, I've been, I'm part of higher education for almost 20 years now. Uh, having um, uh, worked, uh, studied in, um, in, the, in the UK, so I have a perspective on um, uh, UK higher education institutions, having been at places like London School of Economics, uh, Manchester Business School. And of course, for the last seven years, I've been applying my trade in India within higher education itself. Uh, predominantly administrative roles. So I think um, the situation is not that different as far as the uh, the Indian higher education system is concerned. Of course, we have uh, recently come up with a new education policy, which obviously will take some time for it to um, be implemented. And then we might uh, see some uh, output and outcome positive, of course, uh, of that. But I think a lot of it is um, on the implementation. Um, yes, we would like to move away from uh, the systems that have been designed 400, 500 years back helped us create a middle class. Um, you know, but uh, now it's kind of reached a certain um, a barrier. And now this barrier essentially is what next? Um, because at the end of the day, um, what are we staring at? You know, as a higher education uh, person, uh, what are we staring at? We are essentially staring at rising student expectations. Right? The fact is that uh, most higher education institutions in India are predominantly agile setups. Uh, agile setups because um, you know if you're coming in from a, a resource constrained kind of environment, uh, a lot of the dependence and a lot of uh, hope and expectation is around, um, uh, let's say, a job or a placement, right? So technically speaking, a lot of higher education institutions have kind of designed themselves in that kind of model, um, being able to place, being able to provide a job. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, what kind of job? You know, you did talk about earlier, you know, a lot of people might have qualifications, but they're not necessarily doing roles which kind of or should have been done by them, right? I'm not denying the fact that, you know, I'm not saying that any role is um, uh, not equal. But the fact is that many times a lot of these, um, you know, people who graduate from higher education institutions are not necessarily doing what they were supposed to be doing. Is it because of, um, you know, the skill? Is it because of not upskilling at the right time? Uh, is it because of not necessarily, um, you know, getting the right kind of, um, you know, quality education, being in higher education institutions? Um, so, you know, rising student expectations, a very competitive graduate jobs market, rising costs of higher education. Um, you know, some years back when even um, the UK universities increased their uh, undergraduate fees to a great extent. Um, of course, and there's always that debate and, you know, this, this whole, um, you know, thought and actual, um, you know, fact that a lot of students who are graduating uh, from, um, you know, undergrad as well as postgrad programs are essentially in debt uh, as soon as they leave uh, those institutions. So automatically, a lot many of them are actually on the back foot. Right. Um, so the other issue is, are we doing justice to this whole technological change that you talk about in your book? Um, you know, uh, if and the other, uh, you know, irony or dichotomy here is, yes, we're talking about uh, careers. We're talking about living a life. We're talking about um, uh, livelihoods. But at the same time, uh, in the same breath, we're also talking about automation. Uh, we're also talking about the fact that man and machine together. We're also talking about the fact that industry 4.0 is very different, uh, you know, to the other three industrial revolutions, wherein in this particular industry 4.0 revolution, the machine doesn't necessarily need the human being uh, to do a better job, right? So automatically, uh, a lot of these things will then um, impinge uh, on the success rates or the success, um, what we define as success for graduates who are coming out of higher education institutions. Right. So how do you then tide over the technological change is something that most universities across the world and COVID is definitely an example of that. Um, you know, now with you know, all universities moving online, um, have we been able to tide over this situation very well? Not necessarily. Yes, we do teach them, uh, as uh, you know, Dr. Saini was mentioning, we teach them the software, we teach them the programs. But what else? Is there more to be done there? Uh, that's something that we are still you know, kind of um, coming to terms with. How do you operate in a global context, right? The fact is that this whole work from home model uh, will uh, suddenly change things a great deal. You might be sitting in the middle of, um, uh, you know, Delhi and managing a team based in, um, you know, New Mexico, right? Um, how do you then operate in that kind of environment? Um, how do you recruit the best faculty? The fact is that, you know, the higher education institution is as good as the, the faculty that exists uh, within that institution. And of course, the faculty are also transitioning from a certain system, which essentially was, let's say, 300, 400, 500 years old, and are also, in a way, requiring a lot of training. So these are the relevance of the curriculum. You know, how do you approach the learning? A lot of this does require a major, you know, okay, you know, you know, overhaul, maybe an understatement. Uh, may not be uh, enough. I think a lot of deconstruction needs to happen. A lot of uh, change needs to take place. A lot of um, what I would call elephants would need to start dancing, uh, in my opinion, to be able to then ensure that we're able to um, come up to terms with the kind of change we'll see in, in the long term. So you want to keep education, secondary, uh, uh, um, so not secondary. Higher education. Higher ed you want to keep higher education for most people. Well, um, you know, that's obviously a debate, uh, you know, in a country like India, um, you know, there is a goal of um, ensuring that by about 2030, we have at least 50% of the people or the you know, graduate enrollment ratio of 50, uh, which means that 50% of the, um, you know, students who are, you know, eligible for undergraduate um, education, at least are, uh, you know, in higher education uh, inst institutions or universities. So automatically, a country like India, uh, will definitely require, you know, we are at a stage where more and more people should uh, at least experience, um, you know, higher education. The fact is that this, there's a lot of atomization in higher education itself, right? So whether it is universities, whether it is some other form of, uh, you know, education uh, fulfillment that happens, you know, that needs to be brought in. And of course, the COVID and the technological change itself has brought in many other education models, uh, which could be useful. Right. Of course, the same logic, um, you know, whether, uh, you know, there was about 20, 25 years back, there was a lot of impetus within uh, UK universities as well when they 
you know, wanted more and more people to be, you know, you know, studying in universities. So of, co of course we can debate whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but the fact is that, um, you know, uh, we'll have to have a very measured approach. I'm going to, I'm assuming it's a complete waste of time, but that's, let's hear from everybody else. Tanush, you're next. Tanush? Do we have a technological issue? Tanush, can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to switch to Mark and then we'll see if Tanush will catch up. Mark? Uh, you've heard the, yes, thanks for you've having heard the assumptions and you know things are urgent. And my question is, first, tell us a bit about yourself and what you think solution, where solutions lie. First of all, I think that, that we've overstated our, our bounds already in this panel uh, as far as discussions go. And we're proving that education and literacy is behind the times. We don't even know how to hold into a moderated panel. Uh, first of all, I'd, li I'd like to give respect to Sir Ken Robinson, who passed away this year, August 22nd. He is the pinnacle of rethinking literacy and education throughout the world, and he passed away the day before Earth Overshoot Day. Um, um, the other thing your is a little bit your, about me, but it's not quickly. about me. Yes? Can you give us a minute on your background? About to... it? Okay. That's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm an adjunct professor for the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. That's online MOOC courses at graduate and PhD levels, executive certificates that are up to the date, real time information, literacy to date and true. I'm also an adjunct professor for Future IO Institute, the Berlin School for Sustainable Futures, which is a, a university of applied sciences. And today I left the UNESCO Future Literacy Summit. It's in its third day to be at this event. Uh, I take part in future literacy and the importance of education all the time. So I hope that what we can give today is really up to speed to where we need to be. During the pandemic, I created Earth School with TEDx and several other commissions like the World Economic Forum and the United Nations. In the first three days, it reached 70 million people. It was a 30-day quest for children who were in lockdown, couldn't go to school, to learn at home and have an offline activity outdoor in nature included in their parents. That's Great. a little bit about me. And your your thoughts? What? How would you like to scale up? And uh, and what cha what big changes would you like to see? Oh, and you know, systemically. So I'm a big believer in the systems view of life. I, uh, systemic approaches are the only way we'll solve our global grand challenges. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, literacy and education is stuck in the dark ages, middle ages to say the least. Uh, nothing has been improved or updated and we're not getting up to speed with even the digital revolution in that respect. And so I would like us to keep up to speed with our exponentially growing world by using emerging technologies, future thinking, future literacy, and apply those tools and models and tricks that are already on the market today and put them in our classrooms, put them in our homes, and put them in the empowerment of students and teachers for a nice exchange. One of the biggest leaders of our time is Elon Musk, and he created uh, Ad Astra, a school specifically for his children that is not divided into grades or classes, that everybody has the same curriculum depending on how they learn and they thrive, they flourish, and there's numerous other models like that. The, uh, the book, uh, Reimagining, uh, Learning Reimagined, it's by Graham Martin Brown. It was also in conjunction with Sir Ken Robinson, has some wonderful tips and tricks from world leaders in the education industry around the world. What have you learned? You've done MOOCs, you've done scalable teaching. What, what are your learnings? What work? <clears throat> Uh, I believe that every individual needs to be picked up there where they're at, meaning the level that they're at, no matter what their age, their gender, uh, what level of entry. And they it only takes one wonderful leader 
to change the future of our youth. One wonderful leader can change the outcome. One wonderful educator can change the outcome of each and every individual, a message, a connection, uh, and the way of doing that. And so I believe that instead of doing curriculums that are very strict and rigid and force-fed and spoon-fed with a grading system, we need to come up with new ideas to reach out and, and uh, touch those lives that really need it. Um, th there's numerous models, and that goes back to the systemic approach. There is no one size fits all or one uh, silver bullet to solve it all. We need to make it very specific to each and every individual, whether it's grade school, uh, college, university, uh, PhD level, we need to pick everybody up where they're at. How can we do that at scale? It's, it's the right idea. Now, how do we do that for, you know, when we have 9 billion people on the planet and this presumably, you know, a, a billion and a half children or something? Uh, I really believe it starts that we, we start to cover uh, the basic needs of er, er, every human being, where we start with hunger and, and poverty and, and alleviate those is issues, which then have effects on infrastructure, that we get the infrastructure and those basic needs up to speed so that those individuals are even in a place to begin learning, to be thinking about school. If they don't have the basic needs, food, drinking, water, shelter over their head, there's no way in hell you're going to get them to think about school or an education. If they're a refugee from a conflict area, yeah. uh, even at high school or college level, if they're worried about how they're going to live, they don't care about school. They're yeah. worried about their existence. So it's really about the basic needs that we get those resolved as humanity first, and then we can slowly change the education system. Now, in a developing, developing country, we don't have those problems, but we can still change our education systems in developed countries because – they also are based on an old model infrastructure that needs to be ramped up. What we experienced, what bubbled to the surface during the time of the pandemic was unbelievable. It was, it was wonderful because it shone the microscope on all the problems and all the problems bubbled to the surface that we really hadn't hit the technological revolution, that we haven't done digitization, that we weren't prepared to do teaching from home and teaching in a different way than we've ever done before. Many schools pivoted, many schools didn't, and, and, and many parents became educators, which they weren't prepared for. And the numerous amount of problems that arose out of that is enormous. Right on, okay, very good, thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, 30 years ago was 1990 and the internet was just getting started and a lot of things, interesting things have happened. You can sort of compress all that and multiply it by about 10,000 for the next 30 years. Right. It's not even going to be close. It's got it's going to make the last 30 years look like a cakewalk. So where how are we going to get where we need to go? Tanuj, are you are you back with us? Tanuj, can we hear you? No, Tanuj. Can, yes, can you, you just give me a minute to reconnect? Okay, sure, no problem. All right, so so I want to go back to Cardicade because Cardicade nailed the problem, and I want I really want to know. And Mark has some really relevant, important experience at scale with the TEDx and with MOOCs and using technology. So let's talk about solutions. Where are the solutions, Cardicade? Do you have some some specific? Let's try to you know you know go around and talk about solutions now. Yeah, so I think Mark had a, a wonderful and a meaningful points here. And uh, in a developing or most developing countries, there are other challenges, like Vishal said. In a country like India, for example, there is uh, so much of population. Uh, the, the focus of the governments of uh, think tanks has not reached to a level where you were talking about leadership and inclusion and, you know, special educators, for example. That's what I was talking about. But the primary aim is uh, to first get literacy into, into, the, into the population and then give them jobs because there is hunger, there is poverty, people need jobs, people need to earn, etc. Et but at the end of it all, uh, all these are incremental. By the time you reach there, you would have your goalpost right. switched a mile further. 
So like Mark said, we got to, we got to get together now. Uh, we got to change systems. I mean, I'm very impressed with the example he gave about yeah. Astra. I would like to read more about it. So, well, where where is the ex, where are experiential qualifications? Vishal would be able to probably answer that. I mean, today you may not have you may have a law for child marriage. You may have a law for uh, child labor, but everything happens, right? Because when you're hungry, you go to work. So, so a so a retailer who has not studied beyond grade eight has been a retailer for twelve years could take a better class in retail management than a professor. Sure, I believe so. If you look at the <laughs> curriculum, so so where is experiential qualification? How do we manage, Mark? How do we? This is a question to you. That yes, uh, we need to we need to uh, begin with the level of every person. That includes people with special needs, right? That's my focus area. But the idea is, what happens to a place where you don't have schools, where you don't have teachers, where you where you have five hundred children in a government school in a rural area which is non-accessible by road? Forget about Wi-Fi and and you know all the gadgets there, and there is no teacher. What do you do? What do you do there? As I said, 1.4 million only athletes, okay, amongst another 32 million disabled people in remote areas in villages cannot connect to a coach because they don't have a mobile. What do you do there? Yeah, right. So, so the country, every country is 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 kind of in a conflict between the basics. And what we are trying to achieve for the 21st century. So, so I do not know where where would you, David, where, where would you recommend? Do you mind begin? if I answer, David? Please. Okay. So there's a there's a couple of reasons why I was asked to be on the panel because I'm also an advocate for the sustainable development goals for the United Nations. And as I said, we, we kind of need to address the basic needs because if the basic needs are, aren't met, the education and literacy is all, all, always surpassed. If people don't have food, water, if they don't have a, um, a shelter over their head, they're worried about other things in education or literacy. And they're usually making children and girls, uh, uh, boys and girls work on farms or work uh, instead of going to school because of those needs aren't being met. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals, targets, and indicators have really gone under the bus. Uh, uh, and I have to apologize. A lot of people don't know what they are and what it is. I'm going to tell you right now. It's the world's ever first global moonshot. It is a historical precedence, none that the world has ever seen before in my lifetime, in your lifetime, in and since the existence of humanity, the only other time in our world that we've had a moonshot before was John F. Kennedy 51 years ago, sending men to the moon and bringing them safely back to Earth. And that was one nation, one country and a few other uh, maybe thousand players. This is the world's first ever global moonshot. And it is a historical precedence. 197 countries came together for the first time ever to take care of the basic necessities and needs of humanity and to raise the bar higher for all humanity on a global field. Uh, and that is a historical precedence. If you think about it, it's hard enough for two countries to, to decide where they're gonna go to lunch, let alone 197 decide on a roadmap for the future. Now it's not perfect and there's a lot of mistakes, but if everybody knew that that's a roadmap for the future where quality education is a big player in that, but really to get that sustainable infrastructure worldwide at a level where everybody has in, in, inalienable rights to quality education, literacy, and the movement forward for education. Thank you, Mark. Now, I don't know if we have Tanuja or not, because Tanuja is probably having some internet issues, I assume. Do we? Can you talk now, Tanuja? Uh, yes. Can, can you hear me, David? Yeah, for now. <laughs> Go ahead. Take, take about four minutes now. I only have 25 minutes left. Right. So I'll, now, I'll be really quick about this, David. Uh, but whatever you say no we just don't have good enough connectivity we just can't hear maybe can you try taking off your video 
at the oh, bottom. So I'll, I'll switch. Turn I'll off switch your off video. Camera. Yeah. Yes. Okay, try now. Right. So, uh, is it better now? I think it might be. All right. So, so I, I'll just proceed uh, with the hope that it proceeds well. So anyway, so I'm uh, Tanuj Nandan, and uh, I'm a professor at uh, the National Institute of Technology in this place called Allahabad, India. It's a government of India institution. And uh, in addition to my responsibilities as a professor here, I also sit in the placement office. So I look after the placements of all our students. Uh, we have bachelor's programs in engineering. We have master's programs in engineering, in business administration. And then we have the PhD programs. So essentially, we take off uh, where Dr. Karthike leaves the students. And like you said, David, it's pretty much the same as in the US. So the undergraduate uh, engineers come in around when they're around 18 and they complete the program when they are just about 22. And so there I sit in the placement office and I'm also associate dean of academics. And it, it just gives me a unique kind of a perspective because I'm looking at education you know, from three different um, viewpoints. Firstly, as, as an academic myself. Uh, secondly, as someone who is responsible for getting the students uh, then in the, in the street, the, the people come for place, and then also looking after academic administration, uh, looking after assessments and curricula and things like that. And I was really interested in uh, listening to the discussion that happened beforehand because. Oh, your audio is not good now. Uh, now we now okay. we don't hear very well. I'm really sorry. It's too. It's not good. I'm gonna have to switch a little bit. You can bring your video back and listen, but I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't. We can't really make this work. Uh, I would like to be the fifth panelist, if I may. I haven't introduced myself. I'll do it quickly. Uh, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. I've started 15 companies, and. Uh, and I do a lot of thinking about this stuff. And my, I'm going to propose three radical, a three-step radical solution for people who are 18 years old. Number one, first of all, we're going to live to you know age 90 or 80 on average, or, or 100 on average. Children born today, many of them will live up to 100 years old. Many of them will be working well into their 70s. Most people will be who are born today, well into their 70s. So, so my solution is in three parts. Number one. You work four days a week. Number two, you learn one day a week for the for your entire life. And this doesn't have to be exactly, you know, Monday, Thursday, and then Friday you learn. It's it's like you one fifth of the time you're learning, you're skilling, you're upskilling, you're trying to take the next step in your career. And number three, we educate and and really help uh, employers understand that the degrees and the signals mean nothing. And that they should stop looking at, at educational you know, signals and they should start figuring out how to integrate people to solve real problems. <clears throat> there are many ways to do that that they're not doing today. And Elon Musk has said he doesn't want to know if you have a degree. He doesn't care. It doesn't matter. Other people say this, but they don't really do it in practice. So it takes going to take a lot of of evangelization and, and proselytization to get companies to stop the nonsense and start hiring people for their skills and what they can contribute and what they can further learn and keep developing their whole lives long. So that's my radical solution. 18 years old, forget about school, get into the workforce, but get into apprenticeship programs, get into companies that will nurture this concept of work four days and learn one day. Uh, that's a radical proposal. Um, I'm open to anybody now. We have 20 minutes. It's it's really not a radical proposal. It's it's called evolution. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't an avid reader. I wasn't an avid learner. I did average grades until I got into college. But I'll tell you what, I, I read a book a week minimum now. I, I love learning. I will continue learning until I'm dead. Um, it, it's the way to innovate. It's the way to have a successful successful social enterprise is the way to solve our global grand challenges. And um, the, the thing that we're experiencing in this call is really unique. We have the brightest minds with us here today, some great credentials, some wonderful people. 
But what we're seeing is that our digital transition is not up to speed. I'll tell you, I, I, this is a, I promise this is not a commercial for Elon Musk, but Starlink broadband is almost at halfway point of its required Starlink broadband satellites, which will give us one SIM, a high speed internet across the entire globe. And if you've ever heard Peter Diamandis or Singularity University or any of those institutes, this will be the rising of the billions. Those people without smartphones, without internet, without that basic inter infrastructure, they're going to leapfrog onto a system of global access to knowledge and window, wisdom. Now, don't get me wrong, there's going to be tons of fake news and bullshit on there as well, but we're going to be intelligent enough through AI and algorithms to sift through that, to, to dispel misinformation and remove bias and get to the information that's vital for our particular type of learning, whether that's art, creativity, engineering, architecture, healthcare, whatever it is, to get us on the right side of history and to create those resilient, desirable futures. Now, he's not the only one working on that Starlink broadband. There's a couple other companies doing it as well. But I promise you, what we're seeing in 2024 by 2030 would blow your mind away of where we're going to be. Let's get to those infrastructures. Let's make that transition to that future of how we use these technologies for good so that people can get a, an education at home if we're put in another lockdown situation, that they can use the tools of books and online medium wherever they are on this planet. Do MOOCs, go ahead, Vishal. I think, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was uh, going to say learning's not going to go out of fashion, uh, quite frankly, but uh, degrees possibly, um, you know, in, in, the, in the longer term. So I don't think uh, um, degrees and learning may have a perfect correlation. I would love to say technology could be the answer, uh, but the fact is that um, so far, at least the evidence, um, you know, suggests that um, technology could be the answer or technology-assisted learning could be the answer for a certain category of student. Uh, and not necessarily a large base of the students, right? So, you know, if, even if you look at some research that's coming out from Stanford, I think a certain base of students of a certain behavioral orientation do benefit far more, uh, whereas a large base of students, um, you know, maybe at different levels in the distribution curve, don't benefit as much. Maybe that's because of the fact that a lot of us as universities are essentially uh, taking the same thing and transitioning that into the online mode, uh, that possibly could be one of the reasons. But the fact is a lot more needs to be done with the technology, a lot more needs to be done with the content, a lot more needs to be done in how that content is delivered uh, to be able to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, at least countries like India, where there's a lot more reason for us to push up, push the boundaries, make more and more people um, literate, uh, could be taken advantage of. But so far, the other issues obviously are fatigue, uh, you know, issues are of uh, screen time that we see, so I would have loved to say technology could be an answer, but so far, you know, there's a long way to go, David. You know, after your 25, 20, 30, 35, 40, none of the stuff you learned in school matters at all. So how do we keep upskilling for our entire lives? I mean, our working lives are gonna be much longer and, and education will recede into the background as you, as you get older and you still have many decades to work. How do we keep upskilling? So I think, um, you know, if you look at um, uh, this whole concept of micro-credentialing, honestly, we'll have to be learners for, for life. Uh, this whole concept of just-in-time education uh, will be important, more important than degrees, honestly. Um, you know, um, and, and, you know, if you look at, let's say, for example, we've had a, a new uh, education policy after 30 odd years, um, and that policy also talks about the fact that you can, you know, you can drop in, you can drop off whenever you would like, engage with the industry, bank a certain number of credits, come back uh, when you would like, and then maybe continue. So maybe, um, you know, micro-credentialing, just-in-time learning, technology-assisted or face-to-face -face, uh, could be part of the answer. But how do we deliver? What do we deliver? Who delivers? Still remain big questions. Google has opened a micro-credentialing school, a micro-certification school that has been very popular. Uh, and I, is that part of the future solution? What, what are the main ingredients we're looking for? What are the big different things we want to start doing that we got to do a lot more of right now? 
<clears throat> I think we'll have to focus on the content. Uh, we'll have to focus a great deal on, you know, the, uh, the asynchronous and the synchronous nature of what we deliver. We have to focus a great deal on um, making, at least from, you know, um, uh, our context, the Indian context, you know, how um, our students learn has to change, right? So, you know, we do talk about flipped approaches to learning. We do talk about the fact that, um, you know, students should come in prepared um, and then take more benefit, a constructivist approach to learning. But the fact is, it's quite difficult uh, moving in from a very different cognitive approach to learning to a constructivist approach. That needs to fundamentally change as well. Mark, yeah, what works? What do we have to do? So I, I love I love all that's been said. I, I really think that we need to move away from this nationalistic view of, of education um, for the simple fact is if we look at the numbers of, of Indian uh, workers that work remote for other countries around the world, other cities around the world, it is enormous. And there is a, a, a exorbitant amount of labor force and uh, those who were educated in India but are working uh, around the world for different corporations and company, customer service, whatever it may be, technology, programming. Um, and the, the issue that arises is that cultural difference where there's a language barrier, misunderstanding of how people do business in other countries. And we need to get more of this global aspect where we, we kind of get a global operating system, a global standard that no matter where you received your education, that it's of the same standard and quality anywhere, and, but it's one that's continually evolving and up to date so that you can deal with people all over the world and solve their problems and, and help them and to be efficient and feel of worth and feel like you, no matter where you go, no matter what your situation di dictates, that you have value anywhere on this planet, not just because you're from here and there's no stigmatized that you're from India, you're from Africa, you're from Europe, from Germany or wherever, that, uh, that you're better than anyone else. That's bullshit. Uh, we need to get rid of neo-Darwinism, neoliberalism that doesn't exist. That is not survival of the fittest natural selection. It's about cooperation, collaboration, and thinking about the truly global world. We are all citizens of this planet Earth, and therefore we need to get the big history. There are some other great educators, David Christensen and uh, Bill Gates also has, uh, kind of pushed some of this big history learning movements where we're not even getting the basics about the big history of our planet. They're getting muddled up with uh, information that uh, is not vital to our future, not vital to, to what our core learning should be. Let's talk about just-in-time education. We've got Udemy, Khan Academy, the whole YouTube. Whenever I want to do something, I go to YouTube and figure it out first, and then I go do it. This is on a small scale. I might watch for three minutes and then go, you know, make, bake something or fix something. And in Russia, they have something similar, you know. It's, so, so what about just-in-time learning? Anybody? I'm a big advocate of just-in-time learning. I almost think it's more of a skill set. I think it's more of a tool. I, I don't know if it yes, would dear. be classified as higher education degrees or something like that. I think it's get somewhere where you've lacked in picking up or developing the basic skills of the tips and tricks of making life easier, or doing some some things that you're like, well, I want to bake these cookies or I want to fix some plumbing or do something like that that it really puts you a step up that you that you're an equal to others but now there's that added layer if you say wow i learned in this plumbing video that i really enjoy working with my hands and this labor and i might want to be an engineer or i want might want to be going to this direction then you can dive in to the specifics and find that college that university that mooc course that will give you the latest up-to-date technology and information about that field. And then you can go down that, that direction. Another thing going back to the systemic that you touched upon is before we were really in this world of specialists, doctors, PhDs, experts, and specialists in one area, but they couldn't find their ass with both hands on a big systemic problem because they were so tied up in one specific facet. And, and you'd ask them a question and say, I can't speak about that because that's outside of my area of expertise. Well, I'll tell you what, humanity is, is a general skill in, in education. We need you to be 
in some respects, a generalist and understand the systems view approach of sol solving our global grand challenges. The siloed and linear approach isn't helping humanity anymore. We need to think differently. So I think, um, sorry, the, the silos would uh, definitely because of the pressure break, um, you know, you're already seeing that um, universities collaborating with ed tech companies, ed tech companies collaborating with universities. Um, of course, um, you know, to a large extent, this uh, may also be uh, commercially uh, driven at times. Uh, the fact is, if you're looking at that kind of standardization, if you're looking at, um, you know, everybody getting a certain, um, you know, base of education, irrespective of where they are, I think we'll have to open the locks uh, of knowledge repositories that are existing in different parts of the world. So some universities are actually doing that. They're opening up a lot of the learning. They're opening up a lot of their uh, courses, which I think is a, a step in the right direction. I think we've learned from COVID and I, it's a tragedy of immense proportions, but also it has shown us that education is mostly facilities and real estate. And that's what we don't need, right? I think that we, we have to get away from facilities and in-class learning to, I study economics and I've, I've pushed the boundaries in economics and I'm, I'm working at the sort of the tip of the spear in parts of automating monetary policy. And I do that because I watch video lectures and I learn everything online. And a big resource for getting smarter is something like MRU, Marginal Revolution University, where they can put half a million dollars into a video to explain macroeconomics that no professor, no class can come close to. They can do something because it's at scale, because they know 10 million people will watch it, right? And they have the budget. So I think that's the kind of scalability we've got to look for. And it's, again, I think, even though it's intellectual, even though it's PhD level, it's still just in time learning for when you have time to learn what you want or need to know. Final words from people. Let's go around. Kartike? You're... Uh, you're mute. You're muted. Oh, sorry for that. Yeah. So uh, I think everything comes down to the foundations. If today Mark is reading a book a week, uh, I can doctorate in uh, disability management from a university in India at this age, just finish a Harvard course on entrepreneurship skills after having so many businesses behind me. And trust me, I learned. I mean, I, I hadn't heard about uh, John Osher and a serial entrepreneur in the US and I had so much learning. So where does how does it happen to some and how does it not to others? I think it should begin with the school at the foundation level. Uh, I agree with Vishal about content, about, uh, you know, facility, about holistic learning. But then more than that, we need to get a child understand before he moves out of school that learning is lifelong, exploration is good, research is good, dissent is good, questioning is good, thinking forward is good. Going by the trodden path is not good. You you got to you got to choose something which is revolutionary. So the moment the moment he, and this doesn't come in a day. You got got to give him that vibe. You got to give him that strength. Uh, Mark said, "What a leader! One single leader can do to a student." Probably the entire uh, you know organization can't. That is true. So that leader has to be found for each child. So that's how, throughout the life, your life, you would be just in time learning, upgradations, online learning. What you are doing, David, and what you are doing, Mark and Vishal. That's how it will happen. And that's where it cannot come in if we have an age-old pedagogy, age-old system, syllabi, curriculum. And that needs to change. Right on. I love the urgency from Kartike. Tanuj, are you better or not? Can you say, a, you want to say a few things? I think I'm as good as muted when I'm unmuted. But then <laughs> if you can hear me, I'll just add my two bits. Uh, yes. So, uh, you see, I think there's been a lot of talk about uh, this uh, lockdown and the social distancing having taught us things. And that's true. I mean, uh, like we've learned to take education or the classroom online, but then there's only so much that you can teach online. My proposition here is, OK, if you, if you want to learn something about programming or IT skills or maybe economics, it's good enough. But if you want to learn skills, like Mark said, if you want to be a good plumber or something like that. So my, my proposition really is that more of the learning actually has to go out of the classroom. And that's that's a real drastic change because I think our 
the no the spheres of knowledge in which we operate have expanded tremendously and our education system has not kept up with it and what we focus upon and i think that's true for many institutions across the world is equipping our students with information with data with with knowledge but without the understanding of how to translate that into practice and for that reason we need to depend more upon apprenticeships internships we need to make it open classroom and so the owner shifts really both upon academic institutions as well as upon industry academic institutions because they need to rethink their, their processes and they need to be more open so i mean i'm putting the onus on myself uh, principally but then if we look at the industry do they have the space you know it's a numbers game so do they have the space to accommodate so many interns or apprentices possibly not and maybe then that you can tie in like i uh, i believe that at least in india we have a sizable um, you know focus on corporate social responsibility so maybe the the industry can take some of those funds that is dedicated towards corporate social responsibility and invest it into education because that's going to come back to them in the form of more skilled people so possibly that 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 could be something we can look at so my what i'm saying here is it's really good that we can take teaching online but there's only so much of it that you can actually use online the rest of it has to be hands on mm. Okay, I'm going to wrap up and then I'm going to give Mark the last word. If you read the book by Robin Hanson called The Age of M, you will be convinced that all 100% of all work will be done by machines at some point. Uh, if you want to think of it as 2100, that's fine. If you think, oh, that's too, that's not possible, then just go to 2200. I don't know what the year is, but at some point, all 100%, even entertainment, even painting and sculpture, will all be done by machines. Okay, in that context, the next 30 years are critical to getting people the non-repetitive jobs they need and transition our way toward the machine economy. I'm going to give Mark the last word. Thank you, guys, and I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, a wonderful panel of, uh, of great leaders and very intelligent people. I, I have a fond heart for India and the people of India, and I appreciate your guys' wisdom. I want you to know that your president, Shiri Narada uh, Modi's uh, way to gain an election and some of his presidential addresses have been using the latest technology where he presents himself to billions of people at the same time via hologram on a stage. I don't know if you've seen it. I don't know if you've experienced it, but that's using latest technology. When it comes to uh, getting out of the classrooms or off of the computer, off of the technology to learn, I'm in full agreement with you. The problem is if, it, if that environment that we're getting out of off of the computer is one with uh, out sustainable development without basic infrastructural needs, it's trashy, it's dirty, it's not livable for humanity, there is no reason to go outside and, and, and to learn. So as a world, as all nations, my plea is that we accept the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and, and put our shoulders to the, to the grid to make sure that we can transition a new global operating system that will give every human being on planet Earth the same basic infrastructures and needs so that they can go outside, enjoy clean air, good weather, uh, nature, and interact with themselves. And then the times that they do spend in front of these crazy computers, which we've seen plenty of this year, will be efficient and only for that knowledge that they want to learn that will help them to get far in the future. And the rest of that time, as social beings, we'll be loving each other, eating great food, and celebrating life. So I thank you guys, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mark. Thanks to fantastic panelists, Anoush, Vishal, Kartike. I want to thank Dennis Guarda and the Open Business Council Summit for putting on a fantastic event. I really appreciate the chance to have these conversations and to start putting them into practice. We hope to see, let's come back a year from now and let's, let's move the ball even further. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye.